and welcome to another edition of Missouri Outdoors. I'm Kip Woods. Here's what's coming your direction on today's show. Their population continues to increase, so much so they may be endangering themselves. We'll take a closer look at snow geese and see what's being done to try to keep their rising numbers in check. Then, black bears were once thought to be extinct in Missouri, but are they now making a comeback? We'll investigate. In our cooking segment, Martha Daniels serves up a recipe that offers you a taste of the tropics. And Ralph Duran will test your outdoor knowledge in Call of the Wild. We'll have all this and more, but first, we'll tag along with a man on a mission on the Mississippi, and you'll be amazed at what he's discovering in these murky waters. You don't know what's around the next bend in the river. You know, it's like this on the river. You got slow water, you got fast water. That's always changing, you know. Meet Chad Pogracki, a young man with boundless energy that flows from him like the Mississippi River itself. Kind of grew up as a river kid. I used to go out fishing, a lot of scavenging on the islands, just picking up driftwood, things like that. And uh, about the age of 15, I started uh, working with my brother on a shell boat. I also did some commercial fishing, worked on a barge, so in one way or another, always been tied to the river. I noticed how much garbage was out there, and I didn't see anybody going on to go out there and pick it up. While in college, Chad came up with an idea he hoped would do some good and inspire others to act. The Mississippi River Beautification and Restoration Project. The idea was simple the task monumental. Clean both banks of the Mississippi River for 435 miles from Gutenberg, Iowa to St. Louis, Missouri. This refrigerator washed up against a beaver dam is no match for Chad's determination. It's an adventure. I mean, you never know what you're going to pull out. And this day on the river has just begun. That is sick. It's like a landfill, doesn't it? Looks like somebody missed the turn. In under three years of operation on the river, an abbreviated list of Chad's haul includes 1,598 bags of trash, 2,197 tires, 126 refrigerators, 27 bed springs, one 1970 full-size van, 51 TVs. And enough styrofoam to fill a football field a foot thick, and that's a low estimate too. But there's more to keeping this project afloat than most people see. Working the phones takes more out of me than actual physical work. Money turns the props. That's that's how to say it, you know. Without the sponsors, I, I can't go out there and do it. I mean, it takes a lot, a lot of money to keep it going. I try to take the word discourage out of my vocabulary, put persistence in there, but sometimes it is hard because you get so many no's and I'll do whatever it takes to get the job done. Then it's back out on the water. With his eyes on the river, Chad sees things other than trash on the Mississippi and its tributaries that concern him. That's a perfect example. That slough probably about less than 10 years ago was a good running slough with probably maybe clams in it, you know, lots of fish. And now it's not even probably six inches deep. Dirt is the bread and butter of the America. Here we are just washing away, you know? It kind of irks me and I'm gonna hope to fight that someday too. For today's fight, Chad enlists help to retrieve a large tank. Even though this project often looks like a one-man show, he insists it's the hard work and dedication of many that feed the program's success. Teamwork gets, gets the job done, meaning all my sponsors, my crew, everything. Get out from underneath them. All right, that's it. You got it. I enjoy it. I enjoy the work. I, I, I believe in it. It's time for something positive to happen. And uh, 
And this is the gig. That's the one. All right. Operation big mystery barrel thing done. Well, almost. I'll hold it. There it is. <laughs> yeah! like the job's it. not over till they recycle what they can. Tires will go to a shredder or an incinerator, one of the two. Um, and then the metal and the aluminum will go to the scrap yards. Like a propane tank, I'll take back to the propane place. And I don't need any money for it. You know, I'm just happy if they'll take it off my hands. For those who may doubt the sincerity of their recycle and reuse philosophy, make note of the houseboat they work out of. It was sunk on the bottom for, like, I don't know, a day or two. I was headed for a landfill. These guys didn't come to pick it up. They're going to crush it and throw it away. So that was a recycled boat. And that's pretty nice to say, you know, we're living on a recycled boat. It's called the miracle. That's what that was the name of it. It's a miracle. This man lives what he believes. And what's more, he believes in others. Uh, people can definitely make a difference for sure. It might not be picking up garbage. It might be just trying to fix up, you know, like your shore front, or maybe you live in a stream way up and you just want to fix up the stream bank. It all adds to it and it all helps, that's for sure. The Mississippi River Beautification and Restoration Project has pulled over 200 tons of trash, materials, and waste from these waters. And Chad will continue his river crusade making the rivers he loves a better place for all of us. It is like an adventure, and it's a tough adventure, but it's a good adventure, that's for sure. Everything you do helps, no matter how small. It is one of the most breathtaking sights the Missouri outdoors has to offer. Snow geese, by the tens of thousands on an annual pilgrimage from Canada. They're beautiful birds and they're great. And when you see them in these huge flocks and you know they spiral down, they're really beautiful. But the future of these snow geese is in peril. There are an estimated five million of them in North America, so many that they are actually endangering themselves. What has happened is they are now threatening their breeding areas. They have damaged the habitat in the Arctic to the point that they have literally destroyed some of the vegetation and some of their primary nesting areas. Here at their Canadian nesting grounds, what was once lush tundra is now becoming desert land. A few days ago, this whole area would have looked like this, all these grasses, and they've just dug it all up and turned it over. They've eaten the root parts of this plant. Biologists fear that the likely result of the snow geese overpopulation problem will be a cholera outbreak. But it could quickly spread to other species, such as ducks, uh, mallards in particular, and of course that would be devastating. Snow geese hunters like Dick Ducrow and Mike Rail could be a big part of the solution to the overpopulation problem. On a cold winter morning, they're up before dawn putting out several hundred decoys. Mainly what drives Mike and I is having the birds come in. It's, it's the most awesome spectacle you'll ever see. And uh, I can't describe it, you're just gonna have to live it. I think this group turned here, Dick, this lead group. They'll come give us a look anyway. It's just a question of what the altitude's gonna be. Look at them, they're, they're locked in. We see the snow geese coming, then you know something's happening. And so you start to you know, really get all excited and you get to watch it develop um, instead of it being just a total surprise, like a, a flush of a pheasant or of a quail or something like that. So that's one of the aspects of hunting that I really enjoy a lot is that anticipation phase, even before the shooting even starts. Boy, they're just beelining it right on in. I tell people who haven't hunted snow geese before that it's probably the most awesome spectacle of nature they'll ever see in their life, unless they happen to witness a volcano erupting or go to the Serengeti in Africa 
to have 10, sometimes 15,000 birds try to land on you and you know that you caused that is really just indescribable until you sit there and watch it. You gonna call the shot, Mike? Yeah, I'll do it. Do it? Okay. That was pretty good. Come on, Mac. Come on. Success. Yep, have some close encounters with them. And then that's made it all worthwhile. We're building a tradition for snow goose hunting in Missouri, and we're learning that there's not a whole lot of guys that are doing this yet, but some of the ones that are are really learning how to be very effective at harvesting snow geese. Even though it's uh, demanding and fairly difficult, when everything goes right, it's really memorable to be where maybe five or 10,000 snow geese are landing. You know, you can't hardly hear yourself talk, and so it's really a neat experience. Snow geese hunting regulations are more liberalized than ever before in Missouri. Early results are promising, but more hunters are needed to help manage the overpopulation dilemma. Hopefully we'll be able to manage this, uh, the numbers through hunting, but if we're not, then we'll kind of be in another dilemma is what do we do now? With an extended season and a huge population, snow goose is becoming more common table fare in Missouri. So today I have a recipe for it that offers you a taste of the tropics that is anything but common. Mix together orange juice, rice wine, brown sugar, green onion, nutmeg allspice, red pepper, salt, and cloves. Pour half the mixture over the sliced goose meat and marinate for two to four hours. Preheat your barbecue to medium high. Remove the meat from the marinade and grill until it's cooked to medium rare. Pour the other half of the marinade into a saucepan, cook on medium heat until it forms a thick sauce, and serve it as a hot dip for the grilled meat. Your whole family will count the days until goose season when they know they can look forward to Caribbean snow goose. If you'd like the recipe, just write to us. We'll have the address for you at the end of the show. Missouri Department of Conservation biologists Dave Hamilton and Debbie Fonts are hunting for bears. Their tools, three cans of sardines and a bit of string. Bait station, uh, for bears is a way to monitor changes in population over time. It's uh, three cans of sardines that are uh, tied together. They're hung from a tree about oh, eight feet, 10 feet off the ground, just out of the bear's reach. These cans are partially open, so they're dripping some of the oil and uh, smell pretty good, I think, for a bear. And uh, the only way the bear can get to it is climb the tree. And so we can look at the number of baits that are available and how many of them are hit by bears. And as the bear, theoretically, as the bear population increases, more and more of the baits will be visited by bears through time. The biologists also set up a special camera near the bait. Camera on. Triggered by breaking an infrared beam, it's the on. camera should record any visitors to the bait station, providing positive it's proof on. of bears and hopefully a portrait of a female with cubs. Yeah, that's set, that's good. Key piece is missing in our puzzle in Missouri is uh, how much reproduction is going on. And we've got a lot of evidence of males. In fact, the only evidence we have, physical evidence, is, is males. And uh, we wanted to see if we can get a picture of a female with cubs. Black bears were once thought to be extinct in Missouri. In 1931, the last bear was shot in Missouri's boot heel. And for over 20 years, there were no bear sightings in the state. In the late 1950s and early 1960s, bears were stocked in the state of Arkansas, and some of those animals may have come north to Missouri. Whether the result of the Arkansas stocking program or a resurgence of the state's original residents, 
Indisputable evidence now shows that Missouri has a small population of black bears. We think right now the bear population in Missouri is approximately 150, might be as high as 300, certainly under 500. Kind of hard to estimate because they're scattered over a large area, about 30 counties in Missouri. Uh, the department has no plans whatsoever of stalking black bears. We don't feel like it's necessary. We think um, we can encourage uh, the small population that we have to grow and fill in. We think it's a, it's a valuable part of the ecosystem. It has a place. Black bear has, definitely has a place in Missouri. Black bear is the largest and heaviest wild mammal living in Missouri. Standing over six feet tall, and at times weighing as much as 600 pounds, it is an impressive creature known for its strength and power. But we also have come to know another side of bears. Curious, quizzical, even comical at times. Perhaps it's our dual perception of the bear, cuddly and lovable, yet wild and dangerous, that leads to problems when bears and humans come together. Oh my goodness. <clears throat> Boy, he scattered it around, didn't he? He was a little shy when he would come up at first, but then he come, the light was on and he just walked right up here, just real close to me and my daughter. Lisa said, well, mom, look how close he is, or do you see him, you know? And he was right here and we heard him growl. Isn't that amazing? 300 pound animal. The Barrys of Winona, Missouri have firsthand experience with Missouri's bears. For several nights in a row, a large black bear helped himself to some of the Barrys' honey and destroyed their beehives in the process. You can see right here where he's bitten into this honeycomb. And you see uh, the impression there, the circumference of his mouth. Mm -hmm. You see a couple of tooth marks right there and there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Kind of gives you an idea of how big that thing is. And look, here's, oh. a, here's a hair, bear hair. Yeah. Nice it's not uncommon at all to see a bear that's been attracted to some food around people's houses. Just that can get bears in a lot of trouble. Our saying is a fed bear is a dead bear. And we want to educate people to keep foods away from bears so that they don't become habituated, don't become a problem, and cause the death of the bear, or worse than that, uh, injure somebody. And that's the last thing we want to see. OK, it's dangerous for us to have him this close, besides what it does to the nerves. Sure. Uh, and then it's dangerous for him because you know, there's, everybody's not as considerate, you know. We exactly. want him away from here, but we don't want to kill him. Kind of our last resort is trapping and moving a bear. We don't like to do that just because a bear shows up, but one that's been here for a week. Now, when he moves in. He, that's right. One of us moves out. Yeah, so we just, we need to get him back in the woods, um, and we, we'll be willing to come down here and uh, set the trap again. Back at the bait station, the it's a bit of a mystery. The string's been broken from the tree. Only after an extensive search is proof positive uncovered. The unmistakable sign of a bear's fondness for sardines. And the camera with the infrared trigger. Several creatures trip the camera. And finally, a clear portrait of a black bear. Not the hoped for portrait of a mother with cubs, but another bit of evidence of the black bear's continued residence in Missouri. I love bears. Bears are right at the top of my, uh, of my hierarchy in terms of wildness. Uh, and they're just beautiful. I'm just a beautiful animal, sleek and healthy. And it's amazing, I think, that an animal that big can live close to people and almost be invisible. I think it adds a lot to the mystique of the Ozark, Ozark Mountains. Despite their homely appearance up close and undeserved bad reputation, turkey vultures provide a valuable service. They're nature's garbage collectors. By consuming dead animals in fields and along roadsides, vultures perform a job that no one else seems to want. Good eyesight and a keen sense of smell make turkey vultures experts at finding dead animals. They can detect food from miles away by smell alone. You can learn more about turkey vultures in Missouri at Vulture Venture, an annual event held during the winter near Branson.
Nature is the great teacher for all artists. You have to observe what you can find uh, available in nature in order to replicate it two-dimensionally on a piece of paper. Everything that you want in your paintings is available in nature. There are no colors that can't be found in nature. Color is the emotional component in nature. It makes us feel and respond to what we see. I am in constant awe of uh, the world around us. Well, I think that all of architecture begins with nature. In fact, what we have here on Earth is the built environment and the natural environment. And the more the built environment is informed by the natural environment and respects it, the better off we all are. Trees which are able to sway in the wind and have this wonderful sense of structure and not just break in half when, when the wind blows have this capability because of the fact there's so much water in them so that the hydraulics of a tree become a, an interesting concept. And I believe that this notion of how nature deals with forces is, is very important to architecture. Nature all, almost always does things in a very, very efficient way. Buildings are not necessarily always that efficient. So I think there's a lot we can learn from nature. The sense of touch has to have movement in order to work. If you lay your hand on a pine uh, cone or a, a sprig of pine like this, you probably won't know what it is. It's the act of moving the hands that tells you. Touch is a primary way of observing the world. Uh, it's a way to read, it's a way to perceive in ways that I can conceptualize. It's a way beyond words to understand uh, where I live. Being able to identify a bird by its song is tricky, but the hardest part is remembering how it sounds. I use a memory aid. Let me give you an example. Is it a meadowlark, a killdeer, a field sparrow, or a kingbird? Because of the way the note speeds up, the field sparrow's song sounds like a ping pong ball dropped on a table. And remembering that comparison helps me recognize the song. Well, that's it. Thanks for watching, and don't forget, if you get the chance, why not head out and enjoy Missouri's outdoors? That's where I'll be. See you next time.
Enjoy the best of Missouri Outdoors, now available on video cassette. And kids of all ages will enjoy the newly released Just Kidding Around video. For details on these and other conservation videos and publications, write to us at this address or contact your local Missouri Department of Conservation office or nature center. To receive a copy of today's recipe, send us your name and address and the specific name of the recipe. And check out the latest in conservation information on our website.